So welcome again, everyone, to this traffic safety webinar sponsored by the North Carolina Governor's Highway Safety Program. This is one in a series of webinars addressing topics of interest for traffic safety professionals. The series is co-hosted by the Institute for Transportation Research and Education at NC State University and the University of North Carolina Highway Safety Research Center. Today's topic is Wrong Way Driving, presented by Daniel Carter with the North Carolina Department of Transportation. Daniel serves as a project, safety project engineer with NCDOT's Safety Planning Group, where he uses safety analysis methods to inform project priorities and alternatives. His focus areas are in crash data, roadway data, and integrating these data together in a spatial environment for safety analysis. Prior to joining NCDOT, Daniel served as a senior research associate at the UNC Highway Safety Research Center. Welcome, Daniel, and if you'll now share your screen to begin your presentation. I will do that in just a second. All right, we're looking good? Looking good. All right, great. Well, thank you for the... Uh, introduction. Eugene, appreciate that. Uh, so I've been invited here today to talk about wrong way driving in North Carolina. Um, I have a little bit of background in this. I did some research. Uh, as Eugene mentioned, I was with UNC Highway Safety Research Center before I came to DOT. So I've done a little bit of research in this area and, and then I now work in crash data. So I'll be presenting some, some things about what we know about uh, what wrong way driving crashes uh, and then talk about strategies and you know, how how these can be addressed. I wanted to start with just an overview of wrong way crashes. And just, I guess, to be super clear, what we mean is we're talking about crashes that result from someone driving the wrong way uh, against traffic and crashing with someone in that fashion. Uh, magnitude wise, we look, we're looking at about an average of 38 of these uh, per year on freeways. And that's really where I'm going to target uh, much of my discussion today is regarding freeway uh, wrong way crashes. Uh, so about 38 per year, which isn't a huge number. It's a, it's a fairly rare crash type, um, you know, 0.01% of the total crash picture in North Carolina, a little higher than that 0.2% of freeway crashes. Uh, but they are serious, and you can see that in those percentages that it's 0.4% uh, of fatal crashes, but it's almost 6.5% of the freeway fatalities. And so, uh, you know, when we look at freeways specifically, uh, they are not an insignificant portion of, of our, uh, unfortunately, our fatalities on freeways. I've got a breakdown there about the severity. Um, of course, as you might imagine, these are severe when they happen. About a fifth of them are fatal, resulting in at least one fatality. Uh, and then about half of them result in some kind of injury if they don't result in a fatality. The characteristics of these crashes, um, I can kind of sum it up here in a few different ways. About half occur uh, really in the middle of the night between, five, uh, between midnight and 5 a.m. 60% uh, on weekends, so you can kind of start to see the picture of how these crashes usually happen, and about half, and a very significant portion there, half of them are, are related to alcohol. Uh, and that really is, I would say, the, the kind of typical wrong way crash is, is going to be uh, alcohol involved, and it's going to be at night, and of course there are a lot of other types that could do occur, but, but the main typical crash is that. Um, based on our crash data, we see about 20%, 20 involve a driver who's 65 years of age and above and uh, that we, that's a sort of a standard statistic we throw into different types of analyses um, that is proportionally representative of the driving population there uh, and I think you know sometimes there's a there's discussion and, and, and some uh, analysis of wrong way crashes to see is there uh, an issue due to uh, a much older driver uh, maybe some disorientation or something like that I, I think that 65 is a pretty low bar to set for someone that we would consider being disoriented while driving. I think we might want to look more up into the up into 80 years and, and older. Uh, and I think once you get into that age range, you do see some overrepresentation uh, compared to the driving population. Um, but I would say that the major factors here, uh, certainly the big, the big ones, can be alcohol. So you know, while we're talking about this in the area I work in, traffic safety. Uh, we look to see how can we address crashes in general, and specifically here, wrong way crashes. Uh, there are a lot of challenges in, in trying to figure out how can we address these crashes. And you know, first off, they're rare, which makes it challenging. 
there aren't many to go on to determine things like patterns, uh, both of the type of crash that's occurring and, and uh, addition where it's occurring. Uh, so the rarity is a difficulty. Uh, the other big factor here is that it's hard to identify where someone started the wrong way movement. Where did they get onto the freeway going the wrong way? So that entry location is extremely difficult uh, to pinpoint. Uh, drivers can drive miles in the wrong direction before having a crash. In fact, I was I was on a webinar or was hearing a press edition a few years ago, and someone showed they had, um, I think it was in Texas, they had tracked, after the driver had gotten into a crash, they used cameras and went back and tracked where they had come from, and it turned out they had driven something like 20 plus miles in the wrong way on the freeway before colliding. If you think about, you know, these crashes typically occurring in the late hours of the night, there's not a lot of traffic on the road, and so uh, both uh, someone can go down the road without hitting someone for quite a while. And then if they are cognizant enough to, to see visual cues, they're not going to be seeing a lot of visual feedback of traffic going, you know, opposite to them. Um, so identifying the entry point, uh, it's a big issue. Uh, like I said, I did some research in this area. I looked at about 120 wrong way crashes, and I was only able to pinpoint with any kind of reasonable assumptions where the person that I got on in about 20. Uh, and then most of those were because they crashed right there at the ramp, and so it was sort of obvious. That's a big issue when we try to you know, try to say where are these occurring, that kind of thing. Uh, we do know, I have some sense that there are an, some number of wrong way driving incidents, someone going the wrong way, that don't result in a crash. Uh, we've done a little bit of uh, videoing of exit ramps as they go onto the cross street to see where are, are people coming down this exit ramp. Uh, and it's it's shown at least that there, yeah, there are a number of people that go the wrong way, don't end up in a crash, turn around on the ramp, or, you know, maybe maybe it was due to something that maybe they weren't drunk, they could just confused by the intersection and went the wrong way, but then they turned around. So there's a, there's a lot of that that we don't know. We don't have good data on that, um, but that's just kind of a recognition of one of the challenges in trying to address this. I, I have to bring this up because it was something that occurred very recently, just a few days ago. Uh, this trooper, Jessica Schaub, out in Washington State, uh, big, big hats off to her. So uh, she was involved uh, in addressing a wrong way crash that was in, or a wrong way driving that was in the midst of happening. So she gets on the road, she brings traffic to a stop, she gets ahead of the person, brings traffic to a stop. And then as the person's coming around the corner, not slowing down, basically goes up and collides intentionally with the person to prevent them from hitting everyone who's behind her. Uh, you gotta love this though. She then climbs out of her window uh, because the door is smashed up and goes to attend to the wrong way driver to see if he or she's okay. So big hats off to Trooper Jessica, Trooper Jessica Schaub out in Washington State, um, certainly doing a lot more personally to address wrong way crashing than I've done. Um, but to be clear, not exactly the kind of approach that we want to encourage. And I'm not asking our NC State Highway Patrol to uh, undertake these kinds of things. What we're looking for is how can we address these crashes before we get into this kind of situation. So what I'll be focusing on is not something nearly that dramatic, um, but rather engineering strategies, and in particular low cost engineering strategies. And this is something that is resulting, uh, this series of slides I'll present is really coming from a toolbox of strategies that I put together as part of the research I've done before uh, to look at low cost engineering strategies. And so I'll talk through signing, marking, and geometric design strategies. Um, I put the link there in the PowerPoint in case this is uh, put out later and you want to follow that link and see that toolbox in more detail and that sort of thing you can. Let's go through these, um, talk, talk through each one of these. And let's start with the signs category. And of course, uh, the sign you've all probably seen as you've driven on the roads is the wrong way sign. Uh, so this is um, in the MUTCD is a supplement to the do not enter signs and it's positioned farther way from the road to catch someone down the ramp. Uh, and I'll try to have some example photos of each one of these. This is actually from uh, an interchange out there at uh, US 52. Uh, the next strategy is lowering the wrong way signs. And so this is something, uh, the, the, the reasoning behind this is some research showing that older drivers and impaired drivers tend to have their vision directed lower and more at the roadway surface for visual cues. 
Uh, and so the idea behind this strategy is to put that do not enter that wrong way sign more into that field of, of vision. Um, so that's, that's the thought behind this. Um, do consider uh, the potential for visual obstructions. If you're in an area where you have parked vehicles on the street, maybe vegetation. Uh, some states have mentioned the, the concern with uh, mounds of snow, which typically is not a problem in North Carolina, unless you're out in the mountain regions. Um, but for most of the state, probably not an issue, but you know, consider some of these issues if you're gonna be trying this strategy. Uh, reflective strips uh, on the post of the wrong way sign is another strategy that can be done. Uh, this is an example from uh, I-40 uh, near Chapel Hill, uh, basically to enhance the visibility, the conspicuity of that wrong way sign. So it's a, about a two inch wide red strip, reflective material going from the sign to pretty close to the ground. Um, just to put that out there. And this sign is not in the middle of the field as it looks like. I just did a some kind of weird cropping and took the roadway entirely out of it. We do put them near the road. Uh, kind of going up a little bit in terms of complexity uh, would be to install a dynamic warning beacon on the wrong way sign. Uh, the idea behind this is that when a wrong way driving motion is detected, uh, the sign will flash or give some kind of uh, feedback to the driver Kind of a standalone sign as you can see in a couple of photos there. Uh, as far as I know, not something we have in North Carolina, uh, but it is something that a few other states have used or at least experimented with, uh, Texas, Rhode Island, Washington. Uh, so this is something, and, and I'll, I'll, the, the strategies I'm pre presenting here are not necessarily ones that we are using in North Carolina. They are ones that are uh, either known or believed to have some good effect in preventing wrong way driving, uh, just to kind of give you the scope here. Uh, the next one is increasing the sign size, um, and, and same as for the reflective strip on the post, basically just to increase the conspicuity of the sign can be helpful for maybe older drivers or those with um, less in visual acuity at night. Uh, and so I've got the examples for both do not enter in the signs there. That's the, I believe the, the dimensions on there are the maximum uh, that the METCD lists. Um, if you look in the photo here, this is a type of interchange configuration that's going to come up several times in this presentation, the examples. So this is something like you might see at a partial cloverleaf or, or other types of designs where you have the exit ramp coming into the crossroad at an intersection and the entry ramp is directly adjacent to it, parallel to it, as you can see here. Uh, so a lot of the research and work uh, into wrong way driving is focused on situations like these where we could say, yeah, we see the potential for the wrong way driving here. You know, someone needs to go to the right onto that uh, entry ramp, but if they miss, you know, if they're just disoriented or something or confused, they could go down to the left, you know, next to that white truck uh, and, and get on that way. So it's maybe a higher potential for wrong way driving at these locations. So uh, the signing strategy here is to put this keep right sign on the median just to emphasize the fact that the driver needs to stay to the right and get on to that entrance ramp. Picture from uh, US 70 here. Uh, another signing strategy is term prohibition signs. And these are, these are used around North Carolina. This is from Durham here. Um, and so basically if you have a, a situation where there's, there's an exit ramp coming into the cross street, this road, uh, and it's only the exit ramp, so I should, should not turn onto that at all, putting these either no left turn or no right turn, depending on which direction you're coming, uh, to warn drivers away from going into that area. Uh, depending on what the intersection looks like, it could be placed on the corner, on a post, uh, could be in the median on a post, or it could be, as is shown here, up on a next to the signal head. Uh, install freeway entrance sign for an on-ramp. And so as opposed to some of the other signs where we're saying, you know, don't turn here, don't go here. This is, this is to say, this is the entrance. This is the freeway entrance, uh, you know, go, go in here. And so uh, another situation, sometimes if you have a, an entrance ramp that's fairly close to an exit ramp, it's, it could be good to indicate to the driver a little more clearly, you know, this is the place to get on the freeway. So I kind of did a little inset there to blow it up a little since it's hard to see with the green background, white lettering. Another one from this. Uh, 
uh, changing gears a little bit to talk about some of the marking strategies. Uh, first one being installing wrong way pavement marking arrows. Uh, so I've got a, a example here from 421 uh, out in Sanford and just showing that standard white pavement marking uh, the arrow on the on the ramp to show someone that you know if they're going along the, the exit going into the exit hopefully that would deter them and show them hey you're going the wrong way. Uh, could be done as is shown here with white pavement markings it could be done with maybe raised pavement markings there are some states that have used this uh, reflective raised pavement markings and in fact these these kind of raised pavement markers show red if you're going wrong the wrong way if you're coming the correct way, if you're exiting from the freeway, it would show white. So kind of has that supposed to be sort of an intuitive difference there. Another marking strategy is to put in the lane line extensions for turning traffic or rabbit trails or however you want to call them. Um, and basically, if again, you see the situation here where we have the exit ramp coming into the cross street right next to where the entrance ramp is. And so the idea again is someone's turning left and it just helps guide them into a place that they should be entering the freeway and with that going into the exit. A pretty basic one here, but it's worth throwing into the mix, uh, installing, or I should say maybe even repainting, refreshing a stop line at the exit ramp terminal. Uh, so you see the same situation again here, exit and entrance right next to each other. And so if you have the stop bar, at the exit, you know, that's just an additional visual cue to someone, uh, you know, don't cross this, don't go in this way, go into a way that doesn't. So, uh, you know, it's obviously needed for other reasons uh, for, for people who are coming out the exit and stopping there, uh, but this could just be another point in the column of keeping the pavement markings in good condition. Uh, along a similar line, again, trying to make sure someone understands which is the exit, which is the entrance, and making sure they go to the right. Um, if you have a median that's dividing those, as you see here in this picture, uh, providing some good deline or, yeah, delineation around the median to just enhance the visibility of it. So this one actually has that keep right sign. It's got a kind of Chevron marking there, and then also has a maybe somewhat faded at this point. Um, Time this picture was taken, uh, marking going around the median just to help it stand out more. Uh, okay, so another marking strategy would be to move uh, the left turn stop lines forward. And so we need to kind of break this one down a little bit. Um, what we're talking about, you can see my cursor, is the, the left turn from the cross street to go onto the ramp to get onto the freeway. Uh, and one of the concerns is that someone who's turning left as this yellow car is sitting here to turn left uh, may take the turn into the exit and, and go up that way. And that's why we had things like the lead lines, those rabbit trail lines. Uh, but another way of kind of trying to reduce the chances of that happening would be to take that stop bar, remove it as far forward as possible. I know there are a lot of other constraints with you know, the geometric design of the intersection, the signal control, whatever else is going on there, crosswalks and such. But just keeping it as close to uh, essentially the center of the intersection as you can will hopefully decrease the chance that someone might turn, you know, kind of pull their turn short and go into the exit lane. Uh, in a similar vein, installing a channelized island and we, on an exit ramp and so we see here, this is an exit ramp coming into the cross street and it kind of splits uh, for traffic that's turning left as opposed to traffic that's turning right. And if you can imagine if that pork chop island there were not there, you would have a pretty wide expanse of pavement, all of it being the exit ramp. So obviously someone should not turn into that. Um, but the thinking is, you know, wide expanse of pavement, more inviting for drivers to turn into or less of a deterrent, I'd say. So putting the channelizing island there essentially just breaks it up, narrows the effect of width of where someone could turn into that exit lane and hopefully deter those wrong way positions. And just, you know, to kind of emphasize the point, making sure that it's visible, has delineation or whatever else could be added to that to make sure it's visible to drivers high enough, you know, kind of off the surface, that kind of thing. 
Uh, okay, so then the third category from this toolbox is geometric design. So what could be done in terms of the design of the ramp terminal intersection to discourage left uh, wrong way motions? So kind of going back to that left turn issue, if we have vehicles, drivers here on the cross street, they're queued up, they're waiting to turn left to get on the freeway. And again, we don't want them to pull that turn short and go into the exit. We want them to take it on around the median, get into the entrance lane. And so having uh, a median right next to them on the cross street essentially just makes it more difficult geometrically to make that sharp turn and go into the exit lane. And so there's a few strategies related to kind of discouraging this left turn, you know, into the wrong uh, place, into the exit lane. Example off of uh, I-77 at US-21 here. So kind of pivoting 180 degrees, we talked about left turners from the cross street. So now let's talk about right turners from the cross street. We've got a portion of a diamond interchange here, actually not from North Carolina in this case, just an example from one of the research reports. Uh, but pretty typical, I would say, for a lot of places that we have, uh, where we have the exit ramp there on the right coming into the cross street and the entrance at the left. So someone coming along northwards or up in this picture, um, we want to discourage them from turning right into that exit ramp. And so keeping that corner there, and you can tell it's pretty sharp, pretty small radius on that corner. Uh, that's the idea is to use the geometrics of the corner to at least discourage or, or not uh, be tempting to make that turn right into the exit ramp. And depending on that, we don't see a crosswalk here, but I will say, you know, this is also a strategy that comes up when we talk about pedestrian safety and that sort of thing, uh, because when you have smaller corner radii, you can have a shorter crossing distance. We don't see a sidewalk and a crosswalk on this one, but, you know, depending on where you're at, that could be something you want to plan for as well. Uh, this example here looks at retracting median barrier between entrance and exit ramps. So we're back to the situation where we have exit and entrance ramps directly adjacent to each other coming into the cross street. Uh, and again, we want to make sure that someone knows to turn into the, the far right, the, the entrance side of it. Uh, in this example, uh, you can see there's this W cross section guardrail kind of coming all the way up almost to the nose of the median and the concern is that it could just obstruct visually obstruct the person from seeing that there's an entrance ramp on the right side of that and so bring, pulling that back as much as possible you know lowering the visual obstructions allowing someone to see clearly there's an entrance ramp over here uh, the other thing that I don't I don't have a good example photo of this but another thing that you can also bring into this would be making sure that your street lighting uh, follows this same principle. And so, you know, hopefully you don't have a situation where you've got a street light on the left that's clearly illuminating that exit ramp coming in and not on the right. So even just with the lighting itself, you might be tempting someone to go left and go into the exit ramp. You want to make sure that entrance is well. Lighted. Another geometric design, and we're kind of moving a little bit out of the low cost uh, category on this one, but I thought it was a good one to put in here. It is something that is being used in various states, and, and we have it here as well. This is an example from uh, US 1 and 501 in Sanford, putting a roundabout at the ramp terminal, uh, certainly something that's become more uh, typical in North Carolina designs using roundabouts. And in particular, we've got several interchanges going in uh, that have roundabouts where the cross street, where the ramps come into the cross street. Uh, and so uh, I like this one a lot because uh, I believe in concrete, I believe in clear, positive guidance to drivers. And so as the driver's going around the roundabout, uh, it really makes it difficult to go the wrong way and go up the exit ramp. You have to pull a pretty sharp to do that. So, uh, you know, using the geometrics of the roundabout um, to, you know, in addition to other safety benefits that we do see from roundabouts, independent of driving, I think this is just another point in the category of sort of in the column, in the positive column of using roundabouts in the situation, it does deter the conditions. Um, so moving off that toolbox, I just wanted to mention one uh, sort of a new uh, sign type that is being tested in North Carolina. Uh, and I've, I've got the on, the on the road shot here of looking down the exit 
uh, of a particular interchange uh, in Guilford County and a bit of a blow up on the right hand side to show you what that sign is since you can't see it very well. But it's a sign that says turn around. It's got a yellow background and kind of a, a black and yellow border. Uh, so this is something that, that we're using uh, in a few locations right now, uh, basically again to kind of accompany the, the wrong way signs and such to let someone know that they're going down the wrong way to turn around. Uh, on the topic of things we're doing in North Carolina, uh, I wanted to mention what our Turnpike Authority is doing on uh, the, the two corridors of the Turnpike right now. So we've got the Triangle Expressway over in Raleigh, I-540, and uh, the new, fairly new Monroe Expressway down here, Monroe, of course, uh, US-74 bypass. Uh, these roads have a lot of technology on them, of course, for the toll collection, but they've really uh, it implemented a lot of detection technology, and in doing so, they've allowed this opportunity for doing wrong way detection, uh, which is very cool and something that's uh, that's being used to see if they can um, you know, prevent or respond to wrong way incidents. And just kind of an overview of what they're doing on uh, this is on particular on the Monroe Expressway, so the newer one. Uh, when they detect a wrong way driver, and this is using loop detectors and their toll zones to detect a motion going the wrong way. Um, there are signs that, that light up to alert the driver right there in the moment at the location. Uh, there's also notifications sent to a control room uh, via email and some alerts that come up. Uh, so then operators can respond to that to review, look at the video and make sure, yes, this is a wrong way motion. Where is it happening? What kind of vehicle is it? Uh, because then what they want to do is, if it is driving, as quick as possible, pass it on to the Highway Patrol so that they can dispatch someone to respond to that. Uh, so this is a, a relatively new. I think it's been running for a, a year or maybe a little bit more, uh, this system. And so uh, I think I've got it mentioned here. There is a research project going on right now led by ITRI out of NC State uh, to evaluate that uh, wrong way detection program. and. Uh, Look at ways that it's that it's working and any ways that it could even work better and so that's a research project that's currently going on um, scheduled for completion early next year on the topic of research there are a few things going on on the national level uh, this is something that has been a topic of conversation uh, in, in various states uh, in particular texas has had a pretty strong lead in this illinois rhode island a few others so NCHRP, which is the National Cooperative Highway Research Program, essentially it's the research arm of the state DOTs pooling their money together. Uh, there was a report that came out a couple of years ago uh, as a result of one of the research projects on this, which was traffic control devices. Uh, and so I've got a link there for where you can find that report that is finished and freely available. Uh, and then there is a project that is currently going on, 3-135, which is Wrong Way Driving Solutions, Policy and Guidance, uh, really taking a very comprehensive look at everything that's known about this issue and what can be done, what's effective and that kind of thing. Uh, so that's that's still going on. That's got a 2022 completion date on it. So we'll see uh, what that team is doing. And uh, I've got my contact info here. Um, you can call the phone number, but I'm not there currently, but you can certainly email me uh, and I'd be happy to uh, you know, take any questions offline or anything you've got uh, that you'd like to discuss, I'd be happy to do that. Um, but I think right now I'm gonna hand it back to Gene. Daniel, thank you very much. I'm gonna bring back up our um, reminders for our um, attendees uh, that uh, we do uh, invite and encourage your uh, questions. Um, so a couple of ways that uh, you can uh, do that, uh, easiest ways to just uh, open up the Q&A uh, window to type in questioned comments. Remember, you can like uh, a question that's already been asked or you can comment, or if you'd like to raise your hand and speak a question to Daniel, we'd be happy to uh, recognize you and uh, enable your microphone to do that. So uh, we do have one question uh, to get us started here. Uh, Daniel, um, the question is: uh, Spooies um, could be prime locations for getting the freeway, getting on the freeway the wrong way. So, and what is NCDOT doing at these types of locations to prevent wrong way entry? Yeah. So, just to maybe give background, 
people aren't familiar with what that is, a single point interchange or single point urban interchange, basically bringing all of the ramps together at one point, um, and it's a fairly large interchange and a lot of turning motions across that. Um, I would agree that that does seem to have a higher level of probability of a wrong way motion because there's just so many motions and a huge expanse of pavement there. Um, I can't speak to anything specific that we're doing for SPUIs um, other than just that these strategies, a lot of them would apply to many different types of interchanges, um, not necessarily the ones that have you know, the entrance and exits right next to each other. Um, but um, you know, that is some of these could apply there, especially the ones that deal with the ramps themselves, that sort of thing. Um, so I, I, I definitely agree with you. I don't think I have a lot to say specifically about SPUIs, um, but certainly if that is being considered either as a new design or even just addressing an existing one, I think keeping wrong emotions in mind uh, would be very a uh, very good thing to do. Thank you, Daniel. Um, while we're waiting for some other questions to come in, I have a question for you here. Uh, what do we know about the effectiveness of the different strategies strategies that you presented? Yeah, so that's a really good question because you know I went through um, 20 or so different strategies, and that was a pretty big missing piece from everything I presented, which was, does this work, and if so, how much? Um, and those questions still remain to be answered from the research world. Uh, I think that this NCHRP project I mentioned probably brings some, some good hard data to that. I know they're taking a very big sample as much as they can, um, you know, but the, the rarity of the crashes, as I mentioned at the beginning, makes them difficult to study. Uh, in particular, not knowing where they got on, uh, going the wrong way makes them difficult to study. Uh, there is promise from systems like what the Turnpike Authority is doing, where they can track uh, someone is they, knowing where they got on going the wrong way using this technology, all the detection technology. Um, that's that's still a pretty small sample. It may take uh, a while before we can see enough wrong way motions to draw any kind of conclusions. Uh, so really, what's what I've got in that toolbox, what I talked about today, is based on uh, expert knowledge, some logic, some human factors research. Um, to say these are strategies we, we feel probably do have some impact on the wrong, wrong way driving issue uh, and being low cost hopefully that makes them you know easier to implement easier to, to get funded and that kind of thing. Thank you Daniel we have another question that's come in do you know the cost of the 38 wrong way yearly North Carolina incidents and a cost comparison for strategy interventions? Hmm. Uh, yeah, uh, really good question. So you're looking, I mean, the question is really kind of revolving around the benefit cost. Um, if you were to put in signs and markings and that sort of thing, that comes with a cost, but then you're hopefully preventing some wrong way crashes. And so essentially what, you know, what are you gaining? Uh, and we do have, um, in the NCDOT, we do have monetary values we assign to crashes that are prevented. So if you prevent a very serious crash, you've sort of, um, realized a larger monetary benefit, economically speaking, than maybe just preventing a fender bender. Uh, I don't have that the information at my fingertips, I'll tell you that right now. Um, they are serious crashes, they're gonna be, they're gonna be higher value if you, you know, kind of think about it in that way. Uh, so preventing those serious crashes would, would carry with it a higher benefit amount. Um, it, it, it might be tough at this point to really run a benefit cost calculation without some pretty major assumptions. Um, just, just to speak frankly, you know, if we say we want to put this sign, this marking, and, and do this median, and we think we can prevent, you know, two wrong way crashes over the next five years, uh, you can go forward with the benefit cost calculation that that, um, that will be based on an assumption, you know, that, that you're, what you've done is going to prevent those or that even, you know, that many would happen. Um, but uh, I, that is absolutely the good way to go in terms of when you're thinking about what kinds of safety benefits you can realize. Um, but yeah, I, I don't have those kind of numbers right offhand. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, another question that's come in. Do you have data for how many wrong way turns are from left turns versus right turns onto an exit ramp? Uh, I wish I did. It, it's, uh, again, knowing what happened is the biggest drawback we have right now in trying to address wrong way crashes. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> We don't even know where they're getting on. Um, definitely don't know kind of what happened there, except in certain situations, there are a few places that we've actually run some video, some continuous video 
uh, and we've gotten to see the wrong way movements happening, that's a pretty small sample. Uh, you know, it allows us to see something, but not necessarily representative of, you know, going for the kind of question that you've got there, which is a really good question. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, no. Uh, hopefully, as we move into more detection, more instrumentation on the road, maybe, um, or, uh, and this is kind of a change of, of gears a little bit, but you know, getting information from the vehicles themselves, if we move toward a more connected vehicle world, maybe we can start to answer some of those. Thank you, Daniel. Uh, Tracy, let me recognize you. You've posted a link in the chat window for folks. Yep. Yeah, this is just a general uh, NCDOT crash cost um, from 2016. Um, looking at it, there, it doesn't, I don't think it breaks it down into wrong way movements, uh, but it's still useful information for cost per crash. Yeah, I think we've got one that's dated 2018. There might be an update to that. Uh, I don't know where that link is offhand, but I do know that there is, I believe, one update since the 2016 numbers. Okay, thank you for posting that link. Uh, Daniel, another question I have is, uh, is North Carolina going to widely implement a detection system that would alert control centers and law enforcement? Mm. So, <clears throat> you know, this, this idea stems from some places that have done that, at least in a on one corridor, uh, San Antonio, Texas did this for a corridor down there, uh, a very uh, instrumented and de detection oriented system, much like what the Monroe Expressway has. Uh, as far as I know, there's no plans to do that um, on any other roads that besides the, the Turnpike uh, Expressways right now. Um, you know, right now what we're looking to do is kind of use some of these low cost measures, things that can be done uh, either as retrofits or in the building of new projects, keeping these things in mind. Um, so we'll, we'll look to see what the what Monroe Expressway produces. Okay, another question that's come in. Have the warning signs at North Carolina 147 actually deterred any wrong way drivers? I, I can't speak to that one specifically because I'm not sure if we run video out in that area. Uh, my colleague Chris Oliver is the one that's been kind of heading that up, so I haven't been directly involved. Um, that would be the only way I would say we could probably answer that question is if we have video that was running and do some kind of before and after. So, yeah, I'm sorry, I can't answer that one directly right now. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Um, another question that I have, and I guess, again, a reminder, folks, if you've got some additional questions for Daniel, um, please uh, let us know by the Q&A window or raise your hand. Um, Daniel, what about using directional spike strips on ramps to prevent wrong way driving? Yeah, this is this is one that comes up uh, a lot of times. So, you know, what we're talking about here is uh, if you've been to an airport parking lot, uh, you know, the spikes that you roll over that kind of go down if you're going the right way, but if you try to go the other way, they rip your tires up. Um, a lot of speculation through the years, maybe this is something that would, that would work. Uh, you know, but disallow someone from going the wrong way down an exit ramp with these spikes out there. Um, the issue is that those are intended to work at very low speeds, which is, you know, airport parking lot. Um, if they were implemented in a place where you're going to see much higher speeds, like a freeway ramp, uh, you, you would have a lot more issues and concerns with what other hazards might result from a vehicle going much faster over those than was intended. Is the vehicle going to go out of control and cause other problems, other hazards on the road? Uh, so they're, they're not intended for that use. It's not something that would work you know, for this problem. Okay, thank you, Daniel. Uh, we have no more questions waiting in the queue, um, but we do have a few additional minutes, Daniel. So while we're waiting for any other questions to come in, do you have any final uh, remarks you would uh, want to add to your presentation? Uh, I would say just this is uh, something to keep in mind uh, when looking to design new interchanges, new uh, ramp terminal intersections. Uh, it's part of the picture of, of things to consider. That I know there's a lot of things to consider when you're designing those intersections, um, but certainly keep in mind uh, the wrong way movements and take some low hanging fruit maybe during that project development process to try to head those off or at least decrease potential for wrong way movements. Okay, Daniel, thank you again. Well, um, 
no more questions waiting in the queue. So I'm going to go ahead and move into our final slides. But again, while we still have a few more minutes, if some, if um, anything pops up um, uh, while I'm going through the closing slides, uh, please do um, add it to the uh, Q&A window and we'll get you to your question promptly. Um, but I do want to thank Daniel at this time. Um, and uh, we really appreciate your presentation. And we want to thank everyone who joined us today. Um, if you um, do have some suggestions about this presentation or about ideas for future presentations, please also add those uh, to the Q&A uh, window. And, um, and I, I I'll actually pause here because we did have a, another question just pop in. Uh, so we'll take that. Uh, Daniel, the question is, what further research do you recommend for North Carolina? Uh, I think we're, we're on a good track right now to see what we can learn from the Monroe Express, Expressway uh, experience and the fact that they have detectors that can uh, see where the driver got on uh, and you know, kind of pinpoint that way. It's a pretty limited number of miles in terms of a safety study. Um, so I think it's going to be a while maybe before we can get a really good sample size out of that. Uh, I would say probably maybe the uh, the next the next lowest hanging fruit might be to do the kind of thing that NCDOT has started in on, uh, which is the the filming, continuous filming of locations, maybe locations that are known to have some higher incident of wrong way driving and try to sort of, you know, as one person asked, is it more left turning, is it right turning, uh, try to typify those motions and see if there's one or two characteristics that come out, maybe that could be addressed. Um, I think that would be a good way to go. Daniel, thank you. Uh, uh, oh, the question is, was this videotaped or will the slides be available? Yes, um, uh, it is being recorded and we will make the link to uh, uh, today's recording available to you as soon as it's ready. Uh, we'll send out a follow-up email. Um, and um, Daniel, uh, will you be okay if the uh, PDF of the slides are made available online for download? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's fine. All right. So we will make the slides available uh, as well. So thank you for that question. Any final questions before we close out our presentation today? So again, uh, use the Q&A window um, to uh, add those questions and again, to share any uh, ideas you have for future uh, webinar topics. We really uh, appreciate you uh, participating in today's series and we'd love to um, find opportunities to uh, develop other webinars on topics that may interest you. Um, again, as I mentioned, we, we will be a doing a follow-up email uh, afterwards uh, with the recording link. Uh, so you'll have a chance if you missed any part of this presentation to watch it in its entirety. Um, uh, if you are a PE and you are attending the live webinar, not watching the recording, uh, you will receive a certificate uh, for one PDH credit. Um, if you're not a PE, but you also are participating in the live webinar and you would like that certificate uh, for your training records, we'll be happy to provide that. If you'll just simply reply to the follow-up e email that you received and request that certificate, we'll be happy to provide that. But uh, PEs, if you indicated when you registered that you are uh, a PE, we'll send that PDH, that uh, certificate to you automatically. And again, I'll pause here for, uh, uh, just a moment, Daniel, to take in um, one additional comment here. Bear with me while I uh, read this. It says, when it, comes to, when it comes time to design the freeway management systems, which have been funded for some triangle area freeways, so we're talking about the research triangle of North Carolina, there may be opportunities to look at what detection or alerts for wrong way drivers can be included. It's anticipated that there will already be some detection on the off ramps for other purposes. And this comes, uh, this comment comes from David Keelson. Daniel, you have anything to add or, to that? Uh, it's, it's, I, I love to see this kind of thing where we're sharing ideas and, and knowledge about what's going on and where we can look for opportunities to, to work together. So that's a great comment from David. And uh, I, it looks like maybe he's involved in this kind of thing. And so just keeping that in mind that, you know, it might be some good interplay to deter and, you know, wrong way motions as a part of that detection system is really good. I would encourage you maybe to talk with the Turnpike Authority uh, and, and, you know, the lessons they've learned from how to implement that kind of detection uh, and alerts and, and notifications and that kind of thing. So um, yeah, great, David, thanks for that out there. 
Yes, David, thank you very much for that uh, helpful comment. Again, uh, feel free to open up Q&A and uh, ask some more questions while we have some additional time. I'll uh, continue my uh, final slides here. Uh, there is more training available. We've got some other webinars coming up in the uh, future. So we absolutely encourage you to participate in those uh, at this link uh, on that you see here on the screen. And um, uh, you just visit that uh, link and you'll get a list of all the, of our upcoming webinars. At the same website, you'll also find information about the next North Carolina Traffic Safety Conference and Expo. This series of webinars is being sponsored by the North Carolina Traffic Safety Conference. Uh, our next conference will be in 2021 in August, and you'll find details at this website. Uh, we certainly hope uh, you'll attend the conference. Uh, and uh, we also invite you to propose on topics for presentation at that conference. There's a link on the website uh, for presentation proposals, and you can simply follow that link on the website and submit your ideas. So Daniel, I uh, don't see no additional questions waiting in the queue. So one final thank you to you, sir, and thank you for everyone for participating in today's webinar. We hope to see you back here again in the future. And until then, goodbye for now.